Hey family, this is Sarah Jakes Robertson. I am so excited about the incredible word that you're about to receive. There are just a few things I want to tell you before we dig into the word. Number one, let's make this thing official. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You're already plugged in. Make sure you don't miss anything that comes out of this house. The second thing, did you know that it's more than just videos? We are doing so much to help the community and we want you to partner with us in literally changing the world. Give into this ministry so the fruit of it is incredible. The instructions are on the screen. Make sure that you are a part of what God is doing through One Online. Lastly, my husband's book, Balance, is coming out and I am so excited. And I got a gift for you. You will get the first three chapters of the book by going to the link below when you pre-order Pre-order Pre -order the book. You don't want to miss it. It has tremendously blessed my life, and I can't wait for you to see what I've already partaken in. Balance is going to rock this world. Okay, let's get into the Word. I've been praying, I've been studying, and I've been sweating. That's how I know God's got a Word. If you, if you ain't nervous about it, it ain't a Word yet. Um... Nobody really cares but me, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This is my eight year preaching anniversary. One of them, one LA was the first place that I ever preached. So like, it's Mother's Day, but I also, I'm celebrating. Cause child, didn't nobody know that she was gonna be preaching. Um, I was praying about this message and what God would have me say. And it's so funny, I preached this text, but got something different from it. And then I was reading over it again, and God showed me something differently. And I feel like God is just continuing to reveal to me what this message is about. But as I was praying, I felt like God wanted to restore passion in somebody's life. And um, the more that I began praying into this moment, I believe that this is a divine appointment for someone who's been feeling stuck, for someone who's been feeling like they don't know exactly what's next or what they should be excited about. Has anybody ever just lost their passion? Like, a thing that you were once passionate about. Like, I used to have vision for this and strategy and felt like God positioned me here and somewhere along the way, I just got lost in the sauce. And so I wanna share with you what God is sharing with me about that. And I'm gonna be in John 21. Verse 15, I know you all are Bible scholars, but for those of you who need a little help like me, I want to give you some context. Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead at this point in the text, and he's walking around the towns that he frequented. And particularly, he's having an encounter with Peter because Peter had a moment where he denied Jesus right before. And you got to understand that Peter was like, you know what? I'm going to go wherever you go. If they're taking you to the cross, I'm going to the cross with you. But then when it was time to actually go to the cross, Peter was like, I don't even have, I don't even have my wallet for this. I don't know if I'm be able to follow you like I thought I was. And uh, he ends up denying Jesus. Mm becoming someone he never thought he would be. That's what happens to so many of us in life. Sometimes we find ourselves becoming someone we never thought we would be. I never thought I would be this bitter. I never thought I could be this angry. Have you ever surprised you? Like, I didn't even know that it was in me to be there and to do that. But Jesus comes to restore Peter because his work is not done. And in verse 15, it says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you wherever you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. We're going to talk about restoring passion. Spirit of the living God, we receive the gift of your presence. And we recognize that in your presence is our true, most authentic identity. And so, God, I pray that this would be an encounter, a living God with a living soul, a living God with a living being, that a living God would touch the dead thing inside of us and bring it back to life. God, please don't let us just come into this place and leave the same way we came out, but let every dead thing that's on life support inside of us be brought back to life as only it can when your glory falls in this place. God, we give you total permission to blow our mind and and to hold up a mirror that we may see ourselves again. Because God, who are we without you? And what can we do if you are not the strength and the fuel that propels us? So I thank you, God, that this is a moment of restoration. A moment of new beginnings. Breathe into this room as only you can do. And God, please, bless me. No nerves, no anxiety, no sweat, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, help me to stand in this moment as the woman you created me to be and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, y'all can sit down now. Y'all can sit down. I promise you we're going to be out of here so that you can get to brunch. Part of the reason why I know that is because my shoes do have a time limit on them. <laughs> So when my feet start hurting, I don't know, you better get it fast, because when these feet start hurting, you out here by yourself with the Holy Ghost, of course, listen. Um, you know, I don't know if you, your Instagram is like my Instagram, where every time somebody comments, there's like 4X trading. No? <laughs> Whose cousins are these that keep trying to get me to get into training and stock markets? And they're getting slick now, because I don't know if they know I'm saved. You can't just hit me with trading. Now they say, I was so blessed. And then it's like, to meet crypto lore. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought she was blessed by this word God gave me. When I was growing up, I used to want to like get involved with the stock market. I don't know. I was trying to make some money. And I just thought when I was younger, if I learn about the stock market, then eventually I can maybe hustle up on some funds. You know, I'm going to get in on some penny stocks. God's going to blow my mind exceedingly abundantly, misusing scripture, but whatever. Let's go with me. And uh, teach me how to move and function as a, a businesswoman. But the older I got and the more that I realized the strategy connected with investment, I recognized that in order to really make money in the stock market, you have to be in it for the long haul. It's not one of those things where you invest today and then next week you turn around and you're a billionaire, which was heartbreaking for me because I felt like there was a Warren Buffett anointing on my life. And uh, I've been studying a lot more, though, because we're coming to a stage where we're really thinking about generational wealth and provision for our family. And so we've been studying about what we can put in the stock market, what are the stocks that we should be looking at, and just really educating ourselves and reading as much as we can. And I ran across this story from this guy who invested in Tesla when it first started. It's 2011. And he bought it when it first opened. And he bought the stock. Let me read my notes so I don't lie to you. He bought the stock for $23, $23. And a little over a year later, he sells the stock <laughs> for $58. He doubled his money and it looked great that what he had put in, he was able to get out more and there was increase connected to it, but had he learned what I am learning from his story, he would have known that if he would have just stayed in the game, then that $23 stock is now worth over $800. That's what happens to us when we begin to perform well and think that maybe this is as good as it gets, so I better pull back instead of continuing to invest and risk failure. Investment is one of those things with our life and with our destiny 
that we have to be committed to doing for the long haul. Because it's only over time that you can tell whether or not something is going to reach its potential. That's why I think PT says that you got to have the four seasons in a relationship. Because how a person performs on that first date might be different than the way that they perform a year later when they're tired, when they're angry, when they lost the job. You can only really know a person when you've been connected with them over time. That's why we have to be careful, too, when we start getting upset with God about how we felt he should have performed in a season in our life. Because if we look over time, we'll see that God's been faithful. But it's difficult in the moment when you feel like, God, you didn't meet my expectation. And we don't zoom out of the picture to look at all the other times where he didn't meet our expectations. And then we came out on the other side wiser than we thought we were. God, how is it that you disappointed me and appointed me at the same time? See, I want to talk to some real people in this room who have ever had God's disappointment turn into their appointment. God, I thought that I needed that job, but maybe you were really trying to turn me into an entrepreneur. God, I thought I needed that relationship, but maybe you were trying to break a generational curse off of my life. You see, my plans are not his plans, and my ways are not his ways, and there are moments when God disappoints you so that he can set you up. I don't know who's going through a disappointment in this room, but I just want my life to be a testimony that when God disappoints you, it's always so that he can ultimately appoint you. Don't give up because you haven't seen how it's going to play out. You got to see God's strategy over time. It takes time to see why God let them leave you. It takes time to see why God had you walk away. It takes time for you to recognize that God wasn't trying to kill you. He was trying to bring something out of you. God, what is it that you're trying to bring out of me in the midst of this disappointment? God, are you trying to help me establish a new way to do family? Are you trying to help me establish a different way of thinking? because if you have disappointed me I know that there is appointment connected to it so what is it that you're trying to teach me in this moment and it is in those moments of disappointment where if we're honest we lose passion when it doesn't turn out the way that I thought it would I released the song but the song went metal. It didn't go gold. It didn't go platinum. It went silverware. What is this? God. God, I I put the post up and I thought the post was anointed, but I don't know if it's the algorithm. No one was connected to it. God, what is it? What do we do in those moments where it just doesn't turn out the way that we thought it would? These are the moments where we lose our passion because if it's not going to turn into success, if it's not going to turn into popularity, then why am I passionate about it in the first place? If I'm going to ask for forgiveness and change my life, but then the very people who I wanted to forgive me don't forgive me, then why would I be passionate about change? I wish I could talk to some people in this room who understood what it was like to lose passion. I started off on fire, but I lost my fire when I had to put that fire in an environment that couldn't cultivate it. Sometimes you got to cultivate your own fire with your own spirit. But what do you do when your spirit is broken and nothing around you can cultivate your fire? I need someone to understand that you're in the right place at the right time because there's enough fire in this room to help you get your fire back. See, that's why we come together in community because I came in here like a flickering flame, but something happened when I started lifting my hands. Something happened when I saw my neighbors started worshiping where I started feeling like, Maybe if they can make it, I can make it too. Maybe if they can come out on the other side, I can come out on the other side too. As a matter of fact, I want someone who was down to a flickering flame and found out that you could explode again, that you could burn again, that you could be on fire again to have testimony service for the other flickering flames in this moment. If you've ever had God put you back in the game, if you've ever had God heal your broken heart, if you've ever had God help you to write the book, help you to complete the project help you to keep on breaking that generational curse help you keep breaking that generational chain I thought I wasn't gonna make it but there was a wind that came into my life and that wind pushed me back into position the wind is coming the wind is coming the wind is coming for your flame the wind is coming for that fire the wind is coming for that passion anybody who knows when you blow on a flame something happens when you blow on that flame that makes it 
makes it grow. It makes the fire grow. Somebody's in here and that flame has been trying to die on you. Disappointment after disappointment, that flame been trying to die on you. You gave your best and that flame been trying to die on you. I'm trying to save this child, but my flame is dying. I'm trying to continue this wholeness, but that flame is dying. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit still blows. Oh, hold on. I feel God on that. Hold on. I feel God on that. I feel like if we would just take 10 seconds to worship, that we could create enough wind in this room to help the flames that aren't even in this room. You see, because when you got the Holy Ghost down on the inside of you, your flame starts affecting people who aren't even in the room. I got a mother who needs to feel the flame. I got a community that needs to feel the flame. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Blow again, blow again, blow again. Move again, move again, move again. Break again, break again, break again. Root me again, root me again, root me again. You gotta be hungry for a fire. Fire doesn't just come when you're sitting down. Something happens when you position your heart and say, God, I've been losing my flame, but this is my last chance to fight for that fire again. This is my last chance to fight for that flame. God. Somebody's fire's coming back to him. <laughs> Somebody's fire's coming back to them. I hear God saying, I'm going to make you passionate for the next that I am calling you to. But I had to make you lose your passion for where you were so that you could move that passion to where you're headed. Because if you stay passionate about where you are, you'll miss the momentum you need for your next. I don't know who this is for, it's not in my notes. But I hear God saying that it's like the stock market. Sometimes it goes down, but then it shoots back up again. And I hear God saying that somebody's passion needed to come down so that you could reallocate it. So that God could position it properly for your next. Isn't this, after all, what happens with Peter in this text? Peter has lost his passion because he did not perform the way that he thought he would. Life didn't perform the way that he thought it would. And so he has gone back to doing what he knows because sometimes it costs your confidence to do what you love. Sometimes you don't get to do what you love and feel empowered at the same time. Sometimes doing what you love makes you feel insecure. Sometimes doing what you're called to do makes you feel rejected and dejected. And so Paul says, instead of feeling that at all, I'm going to go back to doing that which requires nothing of me. But Jesus cannot allow this. Because if Peter is not where he is positioned to be, Jesus cannot build the church on him. Jesus comes after Peter because Peter is starting to live from his head and not from his heart. And he asked him over and over again, do you love me? Because there, when you've been called to change the world, your world, your corner, your community. You have to use your mind to do it, but you cannot be governed by your mind to stay in it. Oh God. And Peter's come to a place where the algorithms have taken over where the reception has taken over, where the feedback has taken over, and now he's living in his head, and it is no wonder he has no passion because passion is not birthed in the head. Passion begins in your soul. And if Jesus can get Peter back to living in his soul, then he can be reminded of the power connected to what they do when they partner together. That's somebody's word right there. 
Don't allow the industry, don't allow the reception and opinions of others to hijack what started with you and the Lord. Don't allow whether or not they can receive it or understand it to qualify whether or not you can do it. Don't allow your disappointment in yourself to make you miss that Jesus, Jesus knew exactly who Peter was. Oh God. Peter didn't surprise Jesus when he denied him. He only surprised himself. That means that Jesus knew exactly who Peter was. I knew that you were going to deny me. I called you anyway. I knew that you weren't going to live up to who you thought you could be, but I still called you anyway because you can live up to who I see you as. Sometimes you need to thank God that you didn't live up to who you thought you were because if you lived up to who you thought you were, you wouldn't be effective in who God wants you to be. If I lived up to who I thought I was, I'd be behind a desk as a CPA. But because I wasn't who I thought I was, I'm standing in front of you because Jesus knew more about me than I knew about myself. And I won't allow the fact that I failed to to keep me from reaching for what I've been called for. Jesus, Jesus comes back for Peter because there's a lot riding on him and yet he's qualified for it. I want you to hear this. You're qualified for where you've been positioned. You're qualified, oh God, help me. Not just qualified. Peter was the only disciple that Jesus says was anointed to be the rock in which he would build the church. There were 12 disciples, 12 official disciples, and then there were more even after that. But there was a job that only Peter could do. You're in this room. And there is a job that only you can do. Only you and God know what this job is. Only you can break that generational curse in your family. Only you can create that content. Only you can reestablish what it means to have spirituality in your family. There is a job that only you can do. Only you can break down the doors of that industry. Only you can make art have a conscious. Only you can reestablish what it means to have identity that has substance and boundaries. Only you can make mental health common in your communities and not something that is talked about. Only you can change the criminal justice system. When God anoints you, it is not so that you can come here and do what everyone else has done. When God has anointed you, it's not so that you can receive the achievement and the accolades of others. When God anoints you, It's because God has something that he wants to do in the earth that only you can do. So when you get out of position, God gets out of position. And God says, I can't be out of position because I got a hell to chase back. I got a devil to go after. I got demons that need to tremble. And so you got to stay in your position even when the performance doesn't look like what you expected because your performance is not an indication of your effectiveness. Your performance is not an indication of God's anointing. Your performance is not an indication of whether or not God can still breathe on you. Yeah. And so he comes after Peter. And I thought when I was reading this, that he was just restoring Peter's position as a disciple. But it wasn't that. What Jesus is restoring is his passion. Because when he says, feed my sheep to Peter, you got to remember that Peter saw miracles when feeding the sheep. He saw miracles. I saw you take a little boy's lunch and feed the multitude. Your passion is in the history of the miracle that brought you to this moment in the first place. God, my passion isn't in this now moment. Passion isn't in the reception My passion is in the fact that I'm even up against this giant in the first place. I wish I understood better what exactly it was God was trying to teach me and show me when I was reading this scripture. But I feel like part of what God was trying to breathe into my own spirit was to worry less about protecting the performance or perfecting a performance 
and more about protecting my passion. You can have my work, but you can't have my passion. You can have my art, but you can't have my passion. Because if I give you my passion, I give you my strength. You can have what I produce, but you can't have what produced it. And I feel like God wanted someone to understand that it's not whether or not you performed well. It's whether or not you mastered the art of perfecting your performance, perfecting your, protecting your passion. Because your passion is what the enemy wants more than anything. If I can take your passion, you won't be a weapon anymore. If I take your passion, you won't believe that you can break the generational curse. If I take your passion, you won't look at that Philistine and think that you could run up on it. If I take your passion, you won't be brave and you won't be courageous. But if you should ever get your passion back... If you should ever get your passion back, I feel like God wants to give somebody their passion back in this place. If you should ever get your passion back, you'll come to a consciousness that helps you to understand that it never was about that in the first place. It was always about whether or not I could live up to who Jesus said I was. It was always about my obedience. It was always about me producing because I felt connected to it, not because I wanted others to receive it. It was about me producing it because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to say. It was about me raising those kids because I had to step in and get it done. My passion was not connected to their results. It was about my obedience. And I'm passionate when I am obedient. And I am effective when I am obedient. And I am creative when I am obedient. And I have strategy when I am obedient in obedience. We've heard it all the time, obedience is better than sacrifice. What do we sacrifice when we are not obedient? Little by little, we sacrifice our passion. I feel like God's calling somebody to live brave again to be courageous in a fresh way and to not allow your success or failure to define you. Because it's not about that. It's about getting what's in me out of me. That's my whole message. Y'all jacked it up because y'all were standing the whole time. So I couldn't even... Somebody's passion is coming back to them. Jesus is able to get Peter back to a place where he is willing to be that rock that Jesus can build his church on by reminding him of the love, the love of what they did together. I want to invite someone in this moment before we leave to go back in your heart and in your mind to that place of love that produced the area where you're now uncertain. Oh, God. I gotta say it the way I... Remember when you loved who you were. Remember when you loved partnering with the Lord and doing things that you didn't even know you could do. Remember when you felt anointed to cast out devils and to heal the sick? Remember when you felt like five smooth stones are enough? No, I don't have the degree, I don't have the connections, but I got a gift that you've never seen before, and I'm willing to walk in that room and stand up to whatever is on the other side of it. An invitation to get back to love. That first love for Peter, it was Jesus. He was a fisherman, and this divine being comes up to him and says, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. He didn't know what that meant. And then they started walking it out, and Jesus didn't just keep the power to himself. He started giving Peter power, too. And he started saying, go into this town, 
and go perform this miracle. I love who I am when I'm with Jesus. I love who I am when I am borrowing from his courage. I love who I am when I'm borrowing from his anointing. I love who I am when I am showing up the way that he sees me. And every now and then, I start showing up the way that I see me. And I can feel myself shrinking. And I got to get in my head to figure out how do I blow this up again. And Jesus says, you don't have to worry about blowing it up. You don't have to worry about being effective. Just stay in the place of love. In this moment, I want to pray with someone who feels like more than anything, maybe what I need is not a new project to make me excited. Maybe I don't need a new boo to make me passionate again. Don't act like, come on now. All right. I want to feel fire again. <laughs> Sit down. You are the fire. Calm down. <laughs> Extinguish that. I want to feel powerful. I have to tell you, you stand with me. We're going to pray. We out of here. I have to tell you, um, I'm just, you know, I tell my story. That's my thing. I, um, we're planning this tour and, um, you know, when I was in my prayer closet and I was talking to the Lord about it, he was like, I want you to name it like the Revolution Tour. And I was like, that ain't no problem. Boom. I sent it to the team, Revolution Tour. Then I put the graphic on the social media and people was like, I'm ready for a revolution. I was like, slow down, because I don't even know that I can, you know what I mean? I don't even know if that's in me like that. I was just talking, really, you know? I started backing down from the very thing that God gave me. Because when it was time to walk it out, I started living in my head again. And the Lord has been dealing with me over and over again because now we, you know, we got buses and venues and I'm like, bro, like, what are we doing here? And he was like, if you would make it less about wanting to perform well and more about just being passionate about what can happen if I breathe in the room. I don't know about you, but I just want to see the glory of the Lord breathe in the room. At the end of the day, Jesus makes Peter hungry for glory again. I want to tell you about what will make you passionate when everything else fails. When you become passionate about glory, showing up in your life, showing up in your relationships, showing up in everything that you do, God says, I can bless that vision because that vision is about my glory inhabiting the earth. God, I don't want to do it for the accolades. I don't want to do it for the achievement. I just want to do it because I may see your glory on the other side of it. God, I want to see your glory show up in my heart again. I want to see your glory show up in my words again. I want to see your glory show up in my prayer life again. I want to feel like I can pray and mountains move. I want to feel like I could write and change the world. I want to feel like I could raise that child and make them better than what I had. I want to feel like I could break a generational curse and I can only do it if the glory of the Lord is backing me up. So spirit of the living God, let glory fall all over this place. God, let your glory begin to inhabit. Let your glory inhabit. Every particle, every corner, every atom, every molecule. Adam, she could let your glory. I am made for your glory, created with your glory in mind. How dare I allow performance to hijack my very identity? My identity is an extension of your glory. My words are an extension of your glory. My content, my heart, it is an extension of your glory. It is not for monetization. It is not for popularity. Those are cherries on top. At the end of the day, I produce because I want to see glory. God, is this your glory? God is that your glory God I'm moving over here because I feel glory over there God I'm going back there because I feel glory over there I'm chasing glory baby not the kind of glory you'll see on the Oscars not the kind of glory you'll see on the Grammys the kind of glory that makes heaven rejoice the kind of glory that makes generational curses be broken the kind of glory that pulls down strongholds depression can't run up on this glory anxiety can't have this glory I don't know about you but I 
still believe in the glory. I still believe that glory could clean up the streets. I still believe that glory could change my family. I still believe that glory could save my child. I believe that glory could change my mind. You better watch out when you start praying for glory. You might mess around and get some glory. Glory, 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 glory. You know, I'm an old school church girl up underneath this wig. When I went to church, the church mothers would just say, glory, 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 glory. You don't have to have no fancy prayer. Sometimes you just gotta say glory, 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 glory. I'm calling down glory, 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 glory over my mind. Glory, glory while I'm writing. Glory, glory while I'm singing. Glory, 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 glory. The glory of the Lord changes things. The glory of the Lord restores your passion. The glory of the Lord will make you whole. The glory of the Lord will put you back in position. It'll remind you why you do the thing that you do. And if there is no glory connected to it, then it is not for you because you were created for glory. If I can't see God's glory in it, I can see man's glory. I can see my own glory. But God, if I don't see your glory, then I'm just here. Successful but not fulfilled. Peter went back to fishing. He had a net full of fish. But it wasn't glory. When he becomes hungry for glory again, he repositions himself. And that's what I want for you in this room. That's what I want for me. I want to be positioned so that passion is not something that feels fleeting. So that passion is not predicated on performance or reception. I want to be positioned for glory because I just want to be in the flow of the Lord. Did this message help anybody? Would you raise your hand if this... I want to... I want to pray for somebody who's going to answer the call to feed the sheep, to tend to the sheep. And listen, you can be hungry and still feed the sheep. Because a lot of times, Peter has been like, Lord, I'm hungry. How you want me to feed the sheep? I'm, I'm not even the way my stomach is set up. But isn't it funny that this text says, after they had eaten breakfast, once he became full, Jesus says, now it's time for you to feed my sheep. I want every hungry soul, been trying to feed your soul with things that are malnourishing you, making you more empty after you pull from it than you were before you even indulged in it. I want to dare you to take a moment and get out of where you are positioned and to bring yourself as close as you can to this altar. We're going to call this our altar. The beautiful thing about an altar and scripture is that it is a place where you bring a sacrifice. A lot of times we come to the altar and we're empty. And that's okay too. But I want us to have a specific moment and which we bring to the altar our hungry soul. And everyone knows what you've been using to try and feel that soul and how inadequate it has been. How much more it left you desperate. 
Peter didn't even realize it, but his soul was hungry for something. Maybe you've been in this room, and as I've been speaking, you've been thinking to yourself, I didn't realize it, but I think my soul has been hungry for something. I want to submit to you that maybe what your soul is hungry for is glory. Soul is hungry to feel alive again. I just want to feel alive like my existence matters like I can change something like I am empowered somebody's in this room and they are so very tired and you've been thinking to yourself I don't know what's wrong with me and I want you to know that I hear the Holy Spirit saying there's nothing wrong with you you're just hungry for the real thing You're just hungry to be connected to what really matters. And I believe at this altar we can have an encounter that will allow the well to spring up in you because you drink from the well that will never run dry. Isn't it crazy that scripture says out of our body will flow rivers of living water? But then it also calls Jesus the well. That means that the well of Jesus has going to pull out the well that's down on the inside of you. If you've been feeling dry, you've been feeling empty, you've been feeling like you're in a drought, I want you to know that that is the path that allows us to access the well. That we're not going to get to the water by pretending. We're not going to get to the water by performing our way out of this. The only way we get to the water is to start digging. To give God permission to start digging in the area where we need it the most. I've been dry too long. I've been empty too long. I've been existing for too long. God, I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with passion. I want to be filled with glory so that I can go out and shake the earth. Just want to give you a minute in your own way. To open your heart to this moment in which God wants to have an encounter with you. And whatever feels most comfortable and natural to you. To recognize that this message is for me, God. You came after me the way Jesus came after Peter. You came after me. How did you know? How did you send this word? I hear you. I'm responding. Yes, I love you. Yes, I feel you. Yes, I'm stuck. Yes, I'm sad. Yes, I want to feed your sheep, but I don't know how. Yes, I've been living in my head. Help me get back to my heart. Somebody moved out of their heart because their heart was broken, and they think I'm going to Use logic to get myself out of this so that I never have to experience this heart again. And Jesus calls Peter back into heartbreak. Because Jesus knows I can mend that heart. You don't have to run from a broken heart. You don't have to strategize your way out of a broken heart. You can sit right in the middle of the broken heart because my glory can come into those broken pieces. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Bible calls the Holy Spirit the comforter. We need your comfort. Holy Spirit, we want to be settled, not tossed to and fro, but anchored to something that is real. God, we want to experience your glory in a way that only we can when we surrender our lives to you. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. I thank you that you know our end from our beginning and there is nothing that has happened in our life that has caught you by surprise. And yet because it took our breath away, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would breathe in this room. And that as you breathe in this room, that it would no longer be my breath that I long for. But that it would be your breath that I long for. I want to experience your breath again. I want to experience your power again. Holy Spirit, I want your, fo- your Holy Ghost 
to fall in this place is only it can do when we surrender. God, I'm tired of living life on my own. And because I recognize that I don't have to do it on my own, I make room for you to inhabit every part of my being. God, I want you to take back every thought that the enemy has held captive. I want you to take back every gift that the enemy has held captive. I claim it for the glory of the Lord in Jesus' name. I want to go into the enemy's camp real quick. If I've got some prayer warriors in this place, I want you to start praying with me because we're going to go into the enemy's camp and I'm coming for my sister. I'm coming for my brother. I'm coming for my mother who couldn't be here. Spirit of the living God, fall in this place as only you can do. I breathe glory down in this place. God, I plead the blood of Jesus over every household, every every heart, every every gift, every, every mind. And I pray that your glory would begin to fall. Let it water the seeds of our destiny. Let it water the seeds of our identity. I take back my identity from shame. I take back my identity from regret. I take back my identity from depression. And I say who the sun has set free. My God is free indeed. God, I want to experience freedom again and because I know where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty I invite your spirit I invite your spirit again I invite your spirit where there's logic I invite your spirit where there's pain I invite your spirit where there's a stronghold I invite your spirit where there is depression I invite your spirit into my soul and I thank you that as I receive your spirit, that I'm growing again. I'm stretching again. I'm dreaming again. Because it's all in your spirit. God, I thank you for every household, every soul, every dream, every generational blessing represented at this altar. You know every step every memory, every tear, every heartbreak, every whisper, God, you know it. And you know how it haunts them. And you know how it torments them. And God, you know how to silence it. I pray a blessing, God, that silence and stillness would enter their soul, that they would be rooted and anchored because they know you, even if they don't know themselves. Because I know you, I've got access to the best version of me. Silence the whispers, God, silence the noise so that all they hear is you. And when they hear you, God, May they hear love, may they hear peace, may they hear joy, may they hear restoration, may they hear that they are adequate, may they hear that they are called, may they hear that they are anointed because you do not talk down to us. May we hear that we're better than that. You will correct us. May we hear that we could stretch ourselves further than that. I'm not asking you to tell me everything I wanna hear, I'm asking you to tell me what I don't wanna hear too so that I can know what's in me. And God, when I know what's in me, help me to produce and bring it out of me so I can go and get someone else like me. Seal this word as only you can do. Allow it to take root and produce fruit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, family.